So either you win a pro show or you win a certain number of points and then you, the top five or however they do it go. Um, so the first year I was trying to win a pro show, but I didn't. So I was placing really well. I got second, got fourth, got sixth, got eighth. So I was getting progressively worse, still gaining points. And then I didn't go. And the following year I did one show, got third, second show. I won straight in. Um, what most people, I feel like people don't know that it took me seven shows to get to the Olympia. All right, welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lua Vive in San Diego, California. And today I'm joined by IFBB Pro Danny Reardon. Danny, thanks for being on. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So when this episode airs, we're going to be, well, it's going to be the day before the Olympia weekend starts, so next Thursday. <sighs> My so uh, right now we're 16 days out. So I'm, I really want to get into uh, the prep and everything and how that's kind of changed for you over the years. And then I also want to talk, I know that you were runner up last year in the Miss Olympia. So I definitely want to talk about that as well. But to begin with, could you give the audience a little bit of an idea of like what got you down this uh, journey in the first place? Like what, what led you down the path of competing on stage? Okay. So funny story is my high school actually used to put on a bodybuilding contest for the athletes. I know so random that I even went to that high school. Um, so yeah, he put it on for the athletes because he had a respect for bodybuilding, I guess one of the football coaches and weightlifting coaches. So I was always an athlete in school. I did cheerleading and weightlifting. And then of course, when I found out about the bodybuilding competition, he told me to enter. So I did the first two years I won uh, showmanship. So I had a really good routine. Um, so I was kind of a cheerleader with muscles. I think I even had like a Gatorade chugging contest before one of those competitions. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Um, and then the last few years, I actually won the title of Miss Wesley Chapel, the body. So I actually w- took home the gold my last two years. Okay. So this is a high school, just a regular high school. Where is it? Yeah, just a regular high school. It's in Wesley Chapel, Florida. It's actually not like uh, Christian based or anything like that. It's uh, kind of outside of Tampa, Land Lakes area. Okay. And then I, I really wanted to go to UCF. I, I live in Orlando. I really wanted to come here for cheerleading, for collegiate cheerleading. And I had all the skills required, but I didn't get into the college the first year. So I ended up going to the community college and started taking like weightlifting classes, starting to find out like really the science and the anatomy and just like fell in love with that. Mm. And a lot of people were like, Hey, you should compete. And I, I wasn't really, I didn't really know what the NPC was. So I kind of, I did my first competition and I lost. I got second out of two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was, I was also 19, but yeah. I loved what it took to get me there. And I loved the science behind it. I loved learning about it. And I was just like, cheerleading just was like, it was just, it totally took a backseat. And then I went on to actually get my master's in exercise physiology and, and all my education kind of went with my bodybuilding career. So the more that I learned, the more that I grew and I just, uh, I haven't stopped since. (laughs) I guess, you know, one of the knocks, so at Lionheart Radio, we are... Uh, an active lifestyle. So we we talk to a lot of different athletes, runners, triathletes, powerlifters, the gamut. One of the knocks that you see on bodybuilding and physique in particular is the fact that a lot of people from the outside think maybe it's not that healthy for you to compete on stage. So kind of like what is your what is your opinion on that? Has it has it been that for you or has it been not that experience for you? Uh, okay, healthy th- there's a couple different ways I guess you could take the word healthy. Healthy as far as physically I think it's a very healthy lifestyle. Now I'm actually switching over into like a vegetarian lifestyle. So all of the meat, I kind of disagree with. Okay. Uh, I, I'm I'm actually planning on after the Ar- after the Olympia competing again at the Arnold uh, vegetarian. I haven't really told any anybody that yet, but uh, that's a very real possibility for me. Okay. Um, it's so all of the meat. It, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> all of the all of the meat consumption is like unhealthy. But I really think that, I mean, if you think about it, we're exercising, we're drinking a ton of water, we're taking great care of our bodies, we're eating vegetables and like counting our food. I think that it's very healthy. I think down when you, maybe when your body fat gets super low, it can be detrimental, you know, for a couple different reasons, but I think it can be done very healthy. And then especially the the other health thing that I wanted to talk about was mental health Mm. because I find with bodybuilding, you can get very mentally unhealthy in this sport. Sure. Um, if, if you let it make you very mentally unhealthy, it can chew you up and spit you out if you let it. But I think that if you really enjoy what you do 
and you just try to be better every time and you kind of compete with like this light side intention of improving and being better. Not like, Oh, I want to beat this person or beat that person, or I'm competing just for a pro card. Um, you know, I think there are very healthy intent, like intentions that can be taken and very healthy measures that can also be taken to increase like longevity in the sport. Yeah, sure. Let me ask you about the subjectivity. As somebody that competes at the highest level of this sport, and I would I would say the Olympias could arguably be the highest level of this sport. Uh, do you think that does it feel very subjective to you? And and what does that play on your mindset as far as like training sometimes? Because you know I've been I've had friends that are trying really hard to get their pro card, like you mentioned, and it seems like every time they go away with a new takeaway of what that judge wanted to see, and then they work on it hard for seven months, and then they come back, and it. I'm just curious, has that been your experience? I don't want to say I don't listen to what the judges say, but I I come with my best, whatever I think that is. So like something that I needed to work on was back width or back uh, depth and mass. So that was something I took into account. But they also, somebody, another judge that was not on the Olympia piano told me to stop training arms. And I'm like, well, well no way. I'm not going to stop training arms. Um, and so I... A lot of times people will blame politics and this coach and that coach and this sponsor and that sponsor. And I'll be honest with you, like I've never really had like a world renowned coach or world renowned sponsors. And I just, I really think politics are a limit if you, if you let them be a limit Hmm. and if you show up the best on that day, then you're the best. And that's all there is to it. You know, and you just have to keep going and keep improving on, uh, you know, what you think. Because at the end of the day, it's like you're the one on stage. You're the one putting in all this effort in this, you know, the cardio and the diet. And then for it to be something, you know, for you to be some on stage as somebody else's vision for you. Yeah. I just feel like isn't it doesn't do it for me. So I I come my best, my best conditioning. If I'm too conditioned, well, good. Right, <laughs> right, right. Truthfully, that feels like uh, probably a really healthy way to approach life. And no matter what you're doing, right? Like, I mean, if you give your best, there's not a lot else you can ask for. And I think a lot of times we get down on ourselves for uh, X, Y, or Z, whatever that thing is. And it's like, well, if you did your best, there's not a lot more that you can ask of yourself. And there's not, there's nothing else you can do. You leave it up, all, you leave it all on the table. You leave it all on the stage, knowing that you did your best. Nobody can take that away from you. No placing, whether you make it or whether you don't, no qualification can take that away from you. And because sometimes the people who don't do their best win. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and did you always, did you always bring that mindset to the stage, even back in those high school days? That seems like a brutal time in your life to be getting judged on a stage. Oh my God. You know what? I, I don't even know if I thought about it like that. I mean, I think there were a couple articles that were like, what are high school students doing to their bodies and whatever. Right, right. Um, but I just looked at it all like fun. Like I love training. I love, I love, you know, all the, the, the hard work and the effort and, um, when you're bodybuilding and you show up, that's almost like your reward for all of your hard work and effort. Like this is your time to show, to take the hoodie off and to put the makeup on and to just show up your best. And if they like it, they like it. If they don't, you still got to like it. <laughs> right, right, right. You still got to look in the mirror for sure. Yeah. Um, did, and so when you went to high school, when you went to college, did you, uh, you continue cheerleading and competing? Um, I kind of fell off of cheerleading. I tried to coach it for a little while and I did some adult teams. Um, but I really just like fell out of love with it. Mm-hmm. I just stopped. I just, cause I was so into bodybuilding. Okay. Um, and it just, the lifestyle just wasn't for me anymore. And so I really just fell into just the gym all the time, gym and then prepping. And like, I didn't, I have never been to a football game, uh, mm-hmm. a high school or a college football game, but, and I'm, I don't want to say I'm proud of that, but I just, there was really no reason for me to go and to just, it just wasn't my lifestyle. I, I've been out before. Don't get me wrong. I'm, you know, yeah, in my twenties. Um, You're but, a fun person. I get it. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> oh yeah. It was just such a very different college life for me than it was for like a lot of my friends and it didn't bother me at all. The reason I was asking is because did you, so it seems like, yeah, maybe you, you really got into the bodybuilding side of things. And so you just kind of followed that passion, but did you see any kind of a, a drawback in your performance when you started training for uh, bodybuilding specifically, you know, like really focusing on, you know, when you're, when you're training for bodybuilding, it's, it's not always as functional as people say. I mean, being fit is functional, so I don't, I don't like the <laughs> argument, but did your performance like in other things as like a cheerleader, did that take 
a hit oh. as you got better at, at bodybuilding? Yeah, but because of my own fault. Okay. Now I, I started, I, when I was cheerleading, I was, I was very agile. You know, I was stretching all the time. I could move a lot easier. Um, and then I started lifting and I just lifted like up until recently I started doing yoga, which I am like obsessed with. And I'm mad that I can't do it more right now. It was just, I just don't have enough time, but, um, I didn't realize how important stretching was until I couldn't move. And I, cause if you think about it with bodybuilding, we're very much like in the same plane. Mm-hmm. So we're squatting up and down. We do bicep curls up and down, we shoulder press up and down. And like, you almost get locked into this move, this, this spot. Yeah. Um, and then when like, even my posing suffered because it was harder for me to get into the poses. So I started stretching and really taking care of my body mm-hmm. and, and other set other than just exercising it. And that's really helped me a lot. This prep in particular, um, and I was kind of like stubborn to it from before. Like I, I still haven't like foam rolled. <laughs> I'm really? still not there yet. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, and I just started using bands. I mean, I go to like a chiropractor and I get body work done, but yeah, as far as like function goes and like my strength, I don't even care about how much I lift. Like today I squatted with 25s on each side and I don't give a shit. Right. You know, it's, right. it, it's like, it just doesn't, I did the weightlifting thing in high school and I, the thing is I could be strong if I wanted to be, Yeah. but I don't want to get hurt. And it doesn't serve me right now to lift like that. Right. It's not even fun to me. Like, I just don't have that mindset right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, you definitely, you just have to have priorities, especially when you're competing at the top level of a sport, right? And a lot of times you see, you know, you see people like Ronnie Coleman who did lift heavy right up until his shows. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I would say he's not, he's paying for some of that right now, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a place and a time for everything. Mm -hmm. So like some, so we did legs today, like I said. And so one of my sets, I did like leg press. I don't even know how much weight it is. Like four on each side for like 18. So it's heavy, but it's, the volume is high also. And then we drop set. So it's, it's kind of a, I, I like to do a really good mix of it. I really don't lift heavy as far as like low reps, like below eight or six. And I don't really go higher than 25. Ooh, but I, I mess around and awful. Then, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> and because a lot of that you're staying in the rep, right? You're not, you don't always utilize the full range of motion in the rep in order to, to keep that, that blood flow and that pump in the muscle, right? Totally. Yeah. There'll be some partial movements that I'll do. Um, so for like leg extensions, for example, uh, I did like 20 reps and then the last 10 were partials. So just like could barely get it up. Um, but it's like really just, it's all about blood flow and pump. Really, that's what bodybuilding is. And volume is, I think, what gets that. Yeah. And so how old were you when you uh, turned pro? 22. Okay. So were you, and I know a lot of times in pro, uh, or turning pro just means that you got your pro card in, in a certain level in, in the sport. Were you working or are you still working while training? Or, or what, is that, what does that lifestyle look like? Uh, when I got my pro card, I was, so I was 22. I just got accepted into the master's program. And, oh, you're having tea. That's cool. Uh, I love tea. (laughs) Um, I just got accepted into the master's program and I was waiting tables. I was serving. I had a very, very, there was no time for anything. I I literally had my chicken, my little bags of chicken and green beans in my server apron. And I would eat it when I would go into the back and like put a couple pieces of chicken in my mouth and then just keep waiting tables. (laughs) Um, And it was, it was really hard, but I wouldn't give it up for anything. Because it let me know how important competing was to me mm-hmm. and how important school was to me. It really taught me like discipline and, um, you know, it was very, a very, very, very busy time in my life. And then it was weird. It's like after I got my pro card and got into the program, I got to work in the human performance lab. Mm. So my job kind of switched into more athletic or uh, more exercise phys type stuff. And then I got to teach undergraduate classes, which was super cool. So um, I was working. I always had work going on and then now has been the work shifted again. Okay. Uh, now it's social media and it's YouTube and it's making videos. Not only is it just bodybuilding, uh, you know, all day, every day. And people don't realize it's like every piece of gum you put in your mouth matters at some point. Yeah. Every step you take matters. It's not just like, Oh, I sit at home all day and train and eat and train and eat. Right. And then now with sponsors and stuff, I have a responsibility to keep up with. I have followers that are waiting for me to post. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I actually haven't even ever talked about that. So that was kind of cool that you got that out of me right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, earlier you mentioned, um, cause I, I really want to kind of drill into the lifestyle aspect of it. Just, I think, cause I'm curious, but okay. with the, with the yoga stuff, are you doing that because of the, 
the mobility and the stretching like you mentioned or how much of how much of the reason you're doing yoga is actually for the mental aspect and the kind of like forced meditation that comes with it oh because the mental strength seems so important to something like bodybuilding when you're doing sets of 25 you know it's both and i would say it, it's even more mental for me than it is physical okay something that i also started this prep was meditation really almost almost daily okay. um and i absolutely love it i Sometimes I do it before I go into the gym. I'll play a certain song and I'll shut my eyes and set my intentions for the cardio session I'm about to do. Sometimes I sit outside and do it or I lay in the closet <laughs> because it's dark in there. And I meditate and I visualize my moment. And when I go into yoga, it's kind of like a physical meditation, mm -hmm. like a conversation that you have with your body. It's just you and your body. And you know, it's funny, everybody gets scared of yoga because they don't want to get into the poses and this and that. And they don't want everyone looking at them, you know, do the pose wrong. Right, right. But if you're doing yoga right, it's like you don't, nobody else is even in the room with you. Yeah. You take all of it. And it's been such a cool fitness outlet for me because mm -hmm. we're so aggressive all the time in the gym and we're so aggressive, even cooking and eating and like every, but it's, it's a very Zen practice and it humbles you. Mm-hmm because it hurts sometimes and it, you, they make you sit there and then there's like some old man up in the front, like on one hand, like spinning around. <laughs> it's right, just right. like, it's just really cool to be, um, yeah. In that environment like yeah, that mentally. Like, yeah. You get that, the complete opposite end of the spectrum as far as, as far as like physical activity goes. Right. It's like, yeah, yeah, for sure. So why, why do you think you're, you started meditating in the first place and then kind of like, you know, what does that, what does that look like? Are you, it seems more like you're, you're kind of like manifesting what you want to happen, like kind of like visualizing more than like transcendental medita meditation where you're thinking about your breathing, like what got you into that? And then why, I guess, why have you continued? Okay. Well, I do both and, okay. um, so sometimes I'll do the transcendental first and then I'll go into the visualization process because I like to get in that state first before I start visualizing. But what I've learned about the breathing process and, and, and something I heard that was super cool was you lose your mind and come to your senses. And I was like, Oh, I like that. Cause you have to like shut your mind off and really focus on your breathing and everything that is sensory being perceived by your senses, even music. I like guided stuff mm -hmm. cause I, I'm very easily distracted. Sure. Um, so, but it actually, it all started in my off season, I was having like a ton of nerve injuries and nerve pain and I couldn't sleep at night. Um, and meditation, it was something I was kind of playing with here and there and doing like sporadically. Um, and I heard so many great things about it, but I didn't even know if I was doing it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You lay there and you're like, I don't know, am I, is it working? Am I meditating? But I would be, I would only be able to sleep a couple hours. Like there was probably three or four months where I didn't get a full night's sleep because when I laid down, my, my nerves and blood vessels would get compressed and it would be like excruciating pain really? when I would lay down because the fluid shifts would pull. Okay. And so when I stood up, the circulation would start flowing again mm -hmm. and it would release some of that pressure. I have something, I think I haven't been diagnosed with it yet, but I think it's called thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, and it's like a part where your nerves and blood vessels are being compressed by your muscles and the fat on top of your muscles. I think like 9% of girls are born with it, but because I have so much muscle for my frame, mm. I manifest that problem. And then I manifest it super bad when I'm fat in the off season. Okay. <laughs> so this off season, I was chunky and that was, it was like excruciating. So I would, I would lay outside, I would sit in a chair outside with my arms down mm -hmm. and I would just shut my eyes and put on a meditation. And it was really my only thing that I could do to like get some rest and get some relief. And I think out of that, I, I learned a lot about myself mm -hmm. kind of like sure. it was, and then it kind of manifested into me just really wanting to do it all the time and, and take it into like being successful with it, yeah. not just like alleviating pain and alleviating like a depression. I wanted it to propel me in the other direction. And so now even before bed, we'll listen to like abundance meditations or subconscious or like if I'm writing stuff, I'll put on binaural beats. Mm. Um, Cause I'm all about like good vibes. Good vibes aren't just like talking. It's like, you can smell a good vibe. You can hear a good vibe. Uh, you can, uh, taste a good vibe. It's, it's everything. Okay. So that's something that I even started to like, I'll light incense all the time. I have diffusers. I'm super hippie and weird, but, uh, it's just kind of the whole thing. And it's just created this, this self-realization. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that happens is because 
you know, in 2017, the world is loud. Like everything is loud. I mean, you probably yeah. even trying to market yourself have noticed, like even uh, from a company standpoint, like we've done some outrageous things as a company that's like made a little blip in the radar. And I'm like, hold on, we're doing crazy shit here, people. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, everybody has all of these inputs all the time coming in. So I think one of the things that happens when you start meditating is like, you you actually get to feel the like inner peace of shutting out the world and it's just this entirely different experience and you like feel so much more connected to you know the shit around you and to yourself and you're like oh that feeling just becomes so addictive it's so addictive like and it's actually i wanted to say something about that because a lot of people don't get meditation they're like why would you do it and i feel like whenever you do it you practice being in the present moment, almost to the extreme being in the present moment, because mm -hmm. you really have to like close everything and just be quiet. But then it, if you practice being in the present moment, when you're going into your daily stuff, you find yourself more in the moment because you've practiced it. So that's what I found is that, and like, I, you know, I notice everything around me. Like it probably annoys the shit out of people, all the numbers and the signs I get. It's like, uh, probably one of my favorite things ever. And it's good. Just gotten, people will come over and it happens to them and they're like, what are you doing to me? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's noticing, noticing things around you. It's just being, being present. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I might've told this story on here before, but when I, you have to like stick with it because meditation's hard at first. Like it's hard to stay that focus on yourself. And, uh, when I was a couple weeks into it, I was kind of like, I don't really know if I like this or if I'm going to stick <laughs> with it. And I, I woke up in a shitty mood and just like, people do sometimes and I remember oh, yeah. having this conversation with with people at work and I'm just in a shitty mood and it was like for a minute I got to step take a step back and like reflect on like it was like I was looking at myself like wait hold on but what's going on right now with you like why are you in a shitty mood it was like it gave me space between emotion and thought which is insane oh um, but that's one of the reasons that I like it anyway I don't want to go too weird with this podcast but okay because <laughs> yeah. we can do it you yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure um okay so this next question, you can uh, you can decide to comment or you're not, or we can edit it out. It doesn't really matter to me. But okay. uh, when you Google your name, uh, Danny Reardon, you come up with a Huffington Post article. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, the arrest? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what I think is really cool is like your experience has been very human. Like you, you know, you're at the top. And as you say right now, like you're engaged, you have the job of your dream, something you've wanted to do your whole life. Uh, but that path has not been a complete linear line straight up. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what has that been like trying to just overcome, I guess, just the human things that we go through? Well, learning from it, learning from it and progressing it and knowing that it's here to teach me a lesson. Like after that happened, I had like, I think that was like when I like had my awakening. Okay. And it was like as hard as it was and as embarrassing as it was. And it's like, you guys, I was drunk at a party, like right. get over it. it. It's just like the only reason you're making a story about it is because I have somewhat of a little Instagram following at the, at the time, you right. know, and it was like a good story, female bodybuilder or whatever. Right, right. Um, but it was like, thank you guys, because it really made me wake up and it's like, wait, what am I doing? Like, why did this happen? And like, I had gotten fired from a gym before that. I had just graduated college. So I wasn't in school anymore. Got fired from freaking Orange Theory Fitness. And then I missed the Olympia by one point. Wow, damn. So I was kind of depressed and I don't know if I knew it. Mm -hmm. And and the Olympia not going there really hurt the first year. It was tough for me to deal with that because I tried and I missed it by a point. And then afterwards, I was kind of like searching for my purpose. Like I was embarrassed socially. But I started to really think about like, what am I doing this for? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And because I posed those questions, I found answers. And um, had that experience not happened to me, I would never have asked myself those questions. And I don't think I would be the person I am today. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think I would have the relationship that I have today because it made us really strong to even have to, you know, stick together through that. It was nowhere near as bad as what everybody made it seem, but we had to stick together as a team. Right. Because we were both on the line now. Okay. That's but the same, I, the the person in that article, same human you marry? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Uh, he's, he actually went to the, to the jail and like fell asleep outside the outside the place there because they wouldn't let him in. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, everybody's, I mean, I don't know if everybody, but a lot of people have been arrested and I, you know, it just happened to be exactly like Huffington Post, people like that, they're just looking for headlines and you just happen to have one. Yeah. And yeah. it's okay. You know, I, that's how things happen in my life. I'm very extreme. Um, I go through things, but what's been the greatest thing about it all is that it's allowed me to be super honest. 
Like I have nothing to hide. Anybody could ask me anything about anything and yeah. I will tell you. And like, sure. I am completely myself. And that was one of the door openers for me. And I wouldn't want to be in this position any other way. I'll also say like, uh, when I, I was a while ago before I had the show and the company and everything, uh, I'm pretty sure I saw that on Facebook. I was like, a lot, I was probably like 19 at the time. And I was just like, oh man, this is, chick's cool. This is somebody I'd be friends with. <laughs> so I don't think everybody thought it was so bad. <laughs> Yeah, little. It, but the thing at the time that we had going was a T-shirt thing called "Cause a Ruckus." Oh, that's right. And that's I was right. like, "Of course, little monster." There she goes, causing a ruckus. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So I probably, if anything, expanded your your presence. You know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so let's get into the training a little bit. So, well, actually, first of all, let's talk about getting to the Olympia. So you you said you missed it by one point uh, the first time. What is what does that mean? You you're just trying to do a certain number of shows in order to qualify. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first year. Yeah. So either you win a pro show or you win a certain number of points and then you the top five or however they do it go. Um, so the first year I was trying to win a pro show, but I didn't. So I was placing really well. I got second, got fourth, got six, got eighth. So I was getting progressively worse, still gaining points. And then I didn't go. And the following year I did one show, got third, second show. I won straight in. Um, what most people, th- I feel like people don't know that it took me seven shows to get to the Olympia. Seven shows in two years? Yes. Okay. I think it was. Okay. Um, and is that a yeah. lot? That seems like a lot of prep. Yeah, it was a ton of, it was so much, but it was what I, I didn't even look at it like that. I was just like, on to the next, got to get more points, got to mm. get to the Olympia. And for me, there was never a doubt. There was never, ever a doubt that I would not be a pro. And then once I was a pro, there was never a doubt that I would not be an Olympian. mm and now that I'm Olympian, there's still no doubt. It's just, nice. a, you know, it's just that, I don't know, just a knowing. Yeah, for sure. No, that's really cool. You know, your mindset, you seem very, like, very sure and confident about when you get on stage. You don't feel very pressured by the subjectivity of, of the sport. Is everybody on the Olympia stage, does it seem like that? Is that pretty common? No, uh, I don't. I don't think so. I think a lot of people worry about who they're competing with. Like I haven't even looked at the list. Mm -hmm. I had somebody else look at the list and make sure I'm on it. That's all I need to know. I unfollow everybody I compete with. Really? Um, Okay. Yeah. Because really it doesn't even matter. Like it doesn't serve me right now to look at how good they look because truthfully they're Olympians. They should all look good. They should all look jacked, beautiful, tan. And, um, some days, you know, I have a bad day and I don't look as good as them or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, I got to put in the work I have to put in. And I have to put my energy towards me. And if I'm looking at them freaking out, I'm giving them power and I'm giving them my energy that truthfully, I love them all, but they don't deserve it. Not mm-hmm. at this level. So I, I, and I do find that people do that. I feel, I find that they follow other people and it bad vibes them. Yeah. yeah. You know, it brings them down. It's like, stop looking, stop right. looking. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Are, are you friends with most of the people at the top of the sport or is it a very oh, yeah. friendly environment? Like all I'm sports? very friendly. Okay. Uh, but I, but a lot of the girls, I, yeah, I, I have never really had a bad encounter with anybody. I don't really even plan to, I don't, I don't know that anyone's even been like, I think I've gotten a dirty look one time, <laughs> Right. Okay. but of course I probably walked up and gave her a hug or something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just, I kind of believe that you attract the energy you are. Hmm. So if I'm not being catty, then I'm not going to attract that. And if I'm not being negative and all of that, then I'm, I, I probably won't find that either. Okay, cool. And, and so what do you, what do you, what does your training splits look like? So just a, a regular week of training, what does that look like for you? Okay. So recently it, it's actually, I've kind of been doing two body parts a day. Mm-hmm. T- today was just legs. Um, but like sometimes I'll do back and thighs chest and tries like to kind of your typical before this, I was doing one body part a day and really just hitting that one hard and just hammering that. But now that we're getting closer, I like to train things as kind of as often as I can get the blood flow in there. Cause right now I'm not trying to gain so much as I am maintaining. Yep. Um, so, or I'll do, uh, so what did we do the other day? Biceps and shoulders. That was a crazy looking day. Okay. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or like, or chest and biceps or back and tries. So yeah, I, I actually like to switch it up or some days I'll do like touch up days and I'll do like back and glutes and hams, something like that. It's kind of all over the place right now, but okay. it's so I can keep the blood pumping. Yeah. 
And, and you mentioned that you get bigger in the off season. How, what, is there a strategy behind that? Or is it just because you can and you're like so sick of, of not eating? <laughs> God, I feel like it's like a food maturity that I've had to really learn. And something that I envy and admire is people who can reverse diet after a show. Because I'm one of those people where I will, I give it, I literally give it all I have for these shows. I put all the work in, I do the diet, but it's like, we put so much value in the sugar and in the food that we don't get to eat. We put so much value in it. And guess what? It's freaking harming us. Like it's not even good for us. You feel like shit after you eat it. It's not even, it's not even that great. And you wake up the next morning, like you're watery and you just look so nasty. Um, but I feel like for a while I've been putting so much value into that and not into the reward of, you know, eating healthy and everything that I blow up after shows. And then what happens is, you know, you take off from training and cardio and you're eating bad. And then it's almost like this vicious cycle that we get into Mm. of, of, uh, actions that we're not proud of versus like, I, I, I do the best when I eat a little bit of stuff here and there, like a little cookie, whatever. Um, and, but I still train and do cardio. Mm-hmm. I do very well with that. But in the past I have taken off from the gym. Like when I had those nerve injuries, I couldn't train because it inflamed my body. Um, so I would just eat and, but that would also inflame my body. Right. Um, so Sugar, yeah. Oh my God, it was terrible. But this prep has been extremely different. I have very little value in the stuff that I don't get right now. Um, and I'm, I'm a really good cook. I'm not going to lie. So okay. all of my food tastes really good. So I love my diet food. Like I, the only reason that dieting sucks is because I'm, I want more. Mm. <laughs> it's because it's gone. Like the calorie restriction. Yeah. yeah. It, but even like these last two days have been like super saturation, high carb days. And I think it's truly because of my focus, mm. my focus is on conditioning and it's on the food that I get. It, I'm not on Instagram looking at all these, these crazy desserts. You know, I'm I'm not doing that. And I think what happens is people go 16 weeks and all they do is stare at food that they can't eat. Mm -hmm. So of course, what do you do? The minute somebody lets the leash off you, you go to sugar factory and you just binge face and you know, and and then it, I I find that sugar is almost like a drug. Like it feels good to eat it. And then, so whenever you're done eating it, you want more and more and more. Um, And then then you just feel like shit. And then you feel like shit until the next sugar fix. Right. Or something, you know, something else, but yeah, the food, the food thing has been tough and it's something that I'm really going to, especially with the vegetarian thing happening. Um, you know, I was kind of asking the universe for like a different relationship with food, Hmm. like help me look at food differently because it's ruling my life. And I really think it has, it's helped me like, just be like less of a glutton. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and so what do you think it is? What do you think has helped you, you do that? Cause you know, whether you're a bodybuilder or an endurance athlete or a human that just wants to look better naked, that struggle with, with sugar and with things like that is a real, like, I think people's relationships with food is 10 times more of a problem than actually like what they really want. So how have you, how have you like kind of curbed that or worked around that? Um, It's it's setting your intentions or? Yeah. It's kind of like set, I guess it's setting your intentions and being aware of your actual relationship with food. So I think a lot of people are unaware of how much food actually controls their life. And they're, they're unaware of like how much value they put in a brownie versus in a chicken, like, or, you know, in a, in a nice healthy meal, like look at all of the benefits that this is going to help. Look at all of this that this is going to do for you instead of the five second instant gratification that that candy bar is going to give you. But I I think we're almost like, like the, the commercials that we see, like the media, the, the, everything that we're surrounded by almost like force feeds us to like want more sugar. I think we're just almost inundated with it. And we don't realize that anytime we're sad or happy or celebrating or we go to food, we go mm-hmm. out to eat, we binge eat, um, even like for celebratory things, like my fiance and I, we go out to eat. And I think it's something that competing has also created. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's, there's definitely a place and a time, but I think it's the extreme value that people put in the bad food. Yeah. And I mean, it's highly subsidized in the U S too. So it's like from the top down, it's put in so much food, you know, like, I mean, when I first got into the ketogenic diet, that was like one of the first things I just, I saw is I'm like, hold on, there's sugar in everything. Cause I didn't even think I ate a high sugar diet and I was like, nope. But when you drink milk, you're having sugar, eight grams, yeah. you know? <laughs> so it's like, man, that's crazy. So what is it that's causing you to want to go into the, uh, the plant-based diet? 
kind of the thing um, right now, it seems like. It's totally the thing. I feel like there's like an awakening happening on the planet. And I think people are becoming more aware that the middleman of the meat is not necessary. So I'm of the opinion that, and I think it's really just people are not aware that you can be plant-based and still have muscle. Mm -hmm. Like there are so many things that are plant-based that have protein in them, like, and high, like higher than beef. It's just people don't know. And because we grow up being fed milk, Mm -hmm. being fed meat and chicken and burgers, and this is just what we do. But what I'm learning, like tofu has eight essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. There's something called seitan that is 23 grams of protein. It's like higher content than beef. And the way I see it is an amino acid is amino acid no matter how you cut it. A skeletal muscle is a skeletal, skeletal muscle no matter how you cut it. So if you're eating that, essentially you will grow if we're, if we're just concerned about muscle growth. Now, the animals that we're eating, first of all, I have dogs. And I think that's what screwed it up is because pigs are like dogs and dogs want to live. Okay. So it, it's like the, the actual mindset behind the slaughtering of the animal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And our own bodies are being harmed by the meat. Mm-hmm. Um, but also like when the animals, they're animals, right? So it's like your dogs want to live. Mm-hmm. They get scared. At th- My dog gets scared at thunder. So you think a pig doesn't get scared when it's sitting in a, like a cage and before they die, like there's fear horm- hormones circulating in their body. Right. Um, and it's like, if you are where you eat, what do you think we're eating? A bunch of fear, you know, and. And we're such a fear-based society. Everybody is so afraid to do everything. And like, look at all the vegans and vegetarians. They have freaking purple hair. They are so unique. And like, I just admire them so much because it just seems like they are fearless and mm-hmm. they're almost empowered by the plant. And I just feel like the animals eat the plants. We eat the animals. So it's like, there's a middle, there's a middleman there that doesn't need to be there. And what makes me sick is that it's because of money. Mm, it's like yeah. these, these slaughterhouses and all these, like, it's because they want to make more money off of these lives. Right. Yeah. Factory oh farming God. is the most fucked up thing in the world. Well, it to does. be honest with you, it's crazy. And I'm not uh, plant based, but the fact that you can't videotape, like it's literally illegal to show footage of these things is yeah. really all you need to know about the entire industry. Right. That's just fucking crazy. Yeah. And people just sweep it under the rug. And I think with those documentaries coming out, like what the health people are starting to see more, they're starting to see like what's happening and it's not just in the slaughterhouses within our own bodies and like to the planet. Like where do you think all the slaughterhouse waste goes into the ocean? And I think there's a statistic that says all the fish are going to be gone by 2048 mm. or something crazy like that. It's like, that's fish. That's our ocean. That is our livelihood. Right. And it's like, we're, we are doing it because of money. Well, humans uh, will kill anything if we're here long enough. Exactly. Right. And even ourselves. Sure. We're, yeah. we're literally ki- like meat is not what, what I'm learning is that like they're kind of linking meat to different diseases. I don't, I need to look more into this, but like diabetes, heart disease, all of that. And it's linked to meat, like lean meat. What we think is so great is mm-hmm. really not great at all. And like, I, I'm of the opinion that like plants are here to help us like any kind of plant. So like we, they house us, they filter our air. Sometimes if they, if they're taken in the form of a drug, they can help you increase your consciousness. Mm-hmm. They feed us like we can live off of plants. So it's like we're supposed to coexist with animals, I think, and plants are here to help us. Yeah, and I think we just need to take our egos out of our food and look at the plants. Yeah, I have an ayahuasca trip coming up, so that'll be interesting. (gasps) Stop. I want to do one. There's one right here in Orlando. and Yeah. Oh, my God. I want to do ayahuasca so bad. It's It's like a three-day thing. Right, yeah. It's wild that it's coming to the U.S. I think I've heard – Mixed reviews on whether they people think that's a good thing or not, because I think that your shaman has a lot to do with it okay. um, from what I've heard. But so it'll be interesting to see. But there's definitely a consciousness revolution going on, like you talked about, that a lot of people are becoming aware that these things are out there and that they're tools that you can use in order to be more kind of connected. Connected. Yeah. And just see see the oneness in everything. Like one of my favorite shirts that Fit Hustle let me release was One Tribe. And it's TR1BE. Um, and it's cause I didn't like to call my people like my fans and followers. I just didn't like that name. It just put me two up here, mm-hmm. you know? Sure. It, so I like tribe. Okay. So I'm like, you know what? One tribe we're all consciousness is in everything. We're one stream. Uh, so that's kind of where that came from. And people like that. Like they like to be equal, you know, they don't like to be separated. They like to separate themselves. Like if they're, you know, whatever, it's the biggest illusion ever, right. but 
Uh, Man, I did yeah. not see this interview going this way. Okay, so really? <laughs> yeah. have you ever have you looked into DMT at all? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's the the uh, the root compound in ayahuasca, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I actually looked into it a lot, actually. Yeah. So <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dorian Yates actually did it too. Yeah. And so I listened to that podcast with with, with Joe Rogan. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty uh, cool. It is. It's really cool. I think that it's really cool that you know there's the U.S. the government definitely like within like the Reagan administration and stuff is where it stemmed from. But it's interesting how the U.S. is they've put so much emphasis and attention on trying to let you know that drugs are bad for you. And yeah. it's interesting how all of the like the the fittest among us are the people that are like experimenting with these things and, and seeing how they can actually like benefit your life and be used as a tool. And it's like, it, it's just interesting to look back in history and it's like, wait a minute, what, what, who are you trying to save right now? You know what I mean? Yeah, themselves. And in the point that you made about it being a problem uh, coming to America, you know, I think people like the quick drugs. I don't know that people gravitate towards psychedelics sure. more so than they do like the harder stuff. Um, like cocaine. Like, like, yeah, cocaine yeah. or, yeah, it's, I, I don't know that they would gravitate to even pain pills, you know, like, I, I feel like there's a whole other drug world mm -hmm. and I'm not even worried about them overdosing on ayahuasca because it's like, if you do, it'll probably help you. Right. And America needs it. Yeah. So I feel like everybody should just trip. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's interesting is it's work, right? Psychedelics are work. I mean, yeah. you, you know, like there's a lot of deep self-reflection that goes on and like, you're not getting rid of those experiences. Those are, that shit's happening to you. And it's not like getting drunk where, you know, if you drink and you have a crazy night and you wake up and you're like, I don't really remember it. Or maybe you remember some of it. Uh, that's not how psychedelics are. When you, when you do psychedelics, it's like those fucking memories are there. That happened, yeah. you know? It's like super internal and helps you. It's like, it helps you get through things instead of numb things. Mm -hmm. You know, alcohol is so like, how is that legal? It kills people. Like, for example, like weed is, I know it's becoming legal, but you've never seen anybody like really overdose on weed, but alcohol, if you drink too much of it, you could die. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. crazy to me that that's legal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it, and it seems weird, like with the current administration with Jeff Sessions, it's like, what way are we? No, man, we're going that direction. Motherfucker, yeah. we're not going yeah. back there. God damn it. Yeah. No, that's interesting. So, um, well, so with that stuff, how do you stay away from anything, any kind of substance like that during a prep phase where you're going into, like, say right now, we're going into the Olympia? Closer, yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, I would say... It depends on how the prep is going. Mm -hmm. uh, the past preps that I've had, I partied um, not with psychedelics, oh, psychedelics too, uh, before. and um, But like more like traditional, what we would think of as partying. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. More, yeah. In your prep? Yeah. Wow. Yep. God damn. Yeah. And I was still able to like, I don't know how. And I just, I almost just didn't respect where I was and the... Uh, and what I wanted to be, I was almost kind of numbing it and just taking it for total granted. Mm. And now even if I did psychedelics again, I think I would have a new respect for it Sure. than I did before. Like mushrooms was, it was more funny. It was like really funny actually. But I think I would try to be almost more spacey with it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, did, I totally did it my prep, but this prep I have not. And at what point, because because you do seem so aware, at what point in your journey did you did you personally start having this kind of consciousness uh, creep into your life where you kind of became more aware of, you know, the things around you and how you're kind of interacting with the world? Um, like pretty much, I think it was right after the arrest when I started to really question everything and like really look, just really self-reflect. And then from that, I just started to listen to YouTube videos and like, there's not a moment in this house where I am, I'm either speaking uh, or I'm listening to something positive, uh, learning just even like spiritual stuff like Oprah mm -hmm. or, you know, anybody who has something that they can offer me and that can serve me. Like I'm always growing. And I think I had so much time on my hands after that arrest that I was almost allowed that time to learn. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it was, it was all for a purpose. And as I started to learn and then I became aware of like the secret and as cliche as it sounds, five weeks after I watched The Secret, I won my first pro show. And I think everything that I had been doing in my life through cheerleading and manifesting and visualizing, and I never really knew 
I never really put a name to it, but I was doing it. And then once the secret came out, I was like, Oh my God, I do that. Mm -hmm. Like I do that. It, and then I, and then I could see how it could work. And then from there, it was just, it's been crazy. Yeah. And in the best, I like, I, it, there was a period where I would just cry at the drop of a hat, just being so grateful and just like, so just, I'm not even sure I can take this right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've had, uh, some very like people that I respect a lot, uh, talk about some crazy shit that's happened to them, uh, by manifesting stuff. And it, it's just an interesting thing because I've definitely picked that up by reading your blog and by talking to you. I can definitely tell that's like a, a big part of what you do. I just, you know, it's almost like a game. It's fun for me. So the Arnold was the Arnold classic was a pretty crazy like number manifestation. I was just starting to get into the numbers. Like I would catch the time all the time and I didn't really realize like what it meant, but it always, I would always catch it when I was in a good mood, when I was doing the right thing at the right time, I would never catch it when I was fighting with Ian or messing up on my diet or being lazy. It was always like, ah, and then I took it as like kind of a nod from the universe. Mm. Like, all right, good job. Keep going. Like, that's it. That's it. So we're going to the Arnold and I go get a coffee and a water at Starbucks and the total is $11 and 11 cents. And I'm like, holy shit. So pretty cool. And then we get to the Arnold and they check us into room five, five, five. And I'm like, all right, very cool. And I just looked into life path numbers. I don't know if you, I, I like, I was like getting into numerology. So I looked into it and it uh, turns out I'm an eight. It's similar to like your horoscope and that it tells you your personality and everything. So what number do they hand me to compete at the Arnold Classic with, but the number eight? Okay. I was like, all right, what's up? <laughs> like, yeah. What's going on now? Um, and honestly that, so I looked up the number five, 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 and um, it's kind of like a new wave of energy and that expo for me was the best part of the Arnold classic. Mm. I met so many people and that was when I realized the impact I was having. Um, and I made a couple decisions. I cut ties with some things I was doing that I didn't want to do anymore. Um, because I wanted to be more of a role model and it, and the shirts that we actually came out with were mind, body, energy. And, um, it was just a very cool, it, it's been, and it's, it's just even progressed from there after, after I accepted it like that, it's, um, it's been nonstop. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I always wonder how much, what percentage of this stuff uh, happens and then what percentage of because you believe something's going to happen, it actually happens, right? Like sometimes you're like, oh man, the universe is handing me this, but you believe that so strongly that it's like you're actually getting it. And I, I don't really know. I'm just kind of speculating, but. I think it's both. Yeah, for sure. I think people, you know, whatever you believe you can achieve. And that's why like this is um, our belief shirts. Mm-hmm. For the Olympia, because what I needed to do was believe I would be number one. But yeah. last year, I believed I could put up a damn good fight, and I did. Um, but that's what I got was mm-hmm. a damn good fight. Right. Um, so I truly believe that whatever you think is even even bad stuff. You know what I mean? If you're like, oh, don't call me, don't call me, don't call me. The teacher calls on you. It's kind of like belief is so huge because it's a double edged sword, and you can you can use it to manifest whatever you want. Even you know, and I'll let you know how the Olympia goes. <laughs> right, right. But some belief is something that, um, you know, if you really want something, you know, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite books of all time. The universe conspires to make it happen. And I don't think anything just happens. I think even Albert Einstein says God doesn't roll the dice. And I just think that there's a cause and effect to everything. Yeah, I mean, there definitely does seem to be, I mean, no matter how pragmatic you want to look at it, there definitely does seem to be some sort of energy um, you know, below the surface and we can direct that with, with the way that we feel. And you can see that with, you know, just, just friends that are, are negative all the time or family members. And it's like, you're, you are literally negative all the time and you just attract that shit to you. Right. Yes. Yes. You watch them and you're like, well, Jesus, why do you think? Right. You right. know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and it, you know, it's stark when you can see somebody that's like extremely negative like that, but it's like that quote, the, uh, until you make the subconscious conscious, it'll rule your life and you'll call it fate. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, it's a good one, right? Yeah, I like that. Nice. Well, this was a cool interview. I'm glad we went in this direction with it. I know, uh, me too. I'm sorry it's not totally about bodybuilding, but it kind of is though. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'm really, I'm going to be, I'm interested to see what happens when you switch to that plant-based diet. So we might have to do a follow-up after your, uh, you said you're going to be in the Arnold completely vegetarian? That's the plan. And how long is yeah. that prep going to be? Well, we have the wedding, all right, so <laughs> we have the Olympia in uh, September, the mm-hmm. wedding in November. And that November 11th, actually 11, 11 stop. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the Arnold in March. So I'm, I'm, like I said, I want my, uh, my relationship with food to change. So I plan to really be good about keeping an eye on my physique 
as I switched it over to plant based and not just going full cookie face mm -hmm. and then trying to diet as a vegetarian. Right. Um, so I'm really going to just do this really smart because I think that if I can do it, I can be a great spokesperson for people who are afraid to switch to plants because sure. the, the main concern is, is oh, I'm going to lose all my muscle. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, well, coming from a bodybuilder, no, you're not. Right. So I, I, there's, there's a bigger purpose than, than, uh, you know, the, the food thing right now. But w whenever you want to have me on, I would be more than happy to come, even if it's a day after the Olympia, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I, yeah, I definitely want to, I, it'll be cool to follow that journey. I definitely want to see, uh, see what happens. So the Lionheart kicker is the final question. We try to ask every guest and it's based on advice and it can be, uh, it can be bodybuilding advice. It can be universe advice, whatever, whatever you're feeling. If you could give a uh, blanket advice and it were guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear it, uh, what would you tell people? To follow your heart. Okay. Yeah. To follow your heart and believe that, and to believe that you can in fact follow your heart. I think a lot of people chase other things and they don't truly do what they love. And if they would do, if they would only do what they love, they would get all of those other things too. But I think what happens is people don't believe that they can do it. Um, so they almost put it by the wayside and they just fall in line with everybody else. But I think that I've been somebody who's always followed my heart and I'm a very happy person and I'm very fulfilled. And I think that people who really make a big change in the world are the ones who live with passion and who follow their heart and not only, but only, but believe that they can that they can do it. Cause the, the thing about belief is like, it's within us for a reason, you know, that, that dream and that desire and that heartfelt emotion and passion is there because the power is within us to get it done. And mm -hmm. that's where the balance comes in is, is, um, our work and, you know, our, the risk that we take to, to make that dream a reality. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not, my dream is not to be a football player or a figure skater. It's to be Miss Olympia. Right. And I believe it's there because that's what my heart desires. Because it's within me. And, and for people that are listening to this, though, when you say follow your heart, like, what does that mean? Does that mean to just go after things that you're interested in? Because that's, it's kind of abstract. And, and so I'm thinking for people that are listening to this, how do they become in tune with that? Because you're somebody mm -hmm. that has gone through these experiences that has made you very conscious of the things that you want to do and the things that you right. want in life and even how you're going to get them. But for everyday listeners, it's like, yeah, I think I kind of like that, but I don't really know. You know, that's a good, that's honestly a really good point because a lot of people, it's hard for me to even talk about that because it's like, well, I'm an athlete. Right. So of course, you know, I follow my passion. Um, but if you don't, I feel like passion and purpose are very big, scary words and people never jump in, but it's like, follow your curiosity first, follow something that lights you up and that intrigues you and that inspires you. And it may not be the end, of, like it may, like following your heart is like, curiosity, I mm -hmm. think something that you want to consistently learn about and something that you're passionate about. Um, and then also something that you can provide value to others with because something that feels so great and that not a lot of people get to do is help other people and give to other people. So it's kind of like Tony Robbins says the secret to living is giving and through social media and bodybuilding, I've found that out. So I would say for people to first follow your curiosity because now you're in alignment with something that you like. And if you're in alignment with something that you like, if you keep trying new things, if you keep following that curiosity, eventually something is going to light you up and you just won't be able to stop thinking about it. But if you follow something that you're not curious about and that you don't even care about learning about, you're never, you're not even in alignment with like, with like anything, but, but, but sadness. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, eventual, right, right? You know, it's like if you're working hard towards something that you hate, you're stressed. Mm -hmm. If you're working hard towards something that you love, you're like striving and you're inspiring people. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So that in in my book, that's actually like the exact path that I tell people to take. Is like when oh. you're interested in something, you should just go through that door, regardless of how interested you are. Because once you go through enough doors, you're gonna find things that resonate with you, and then you're gonna find things that are like, oh, I guess I'm not really. I was more into the idea of that than actually doing that thing. And as you continue down that path, and you find more things that resonate with you, soon you're like actually kind of coming in line with what you should be doing. Totally. That's kind of my theory. So I like. I'm yeah. glad that you have the same one. Good. I'm glad I got to get that out because a lot of people say, I say, you know, they say, oh, it's easy for you to follow your purpose and right. your passion. But, right. but I was a cheerleader and I went to school because I was like into the science and everything about bodybuilding. So there was a, there was a point in my life where I didn't, I wasn't sure that I liked lifting weights and doing fitness stuff, but out of me following that came 
it, it became what it became. And then so much more and it's still becoming it's I'm still I don't know that I've still fully realized everything yet. But my purpose is very strong. And it took me eight years of competing to figure it out. So yeah, I mean, that's the journey, right? That's life. Yeah, that's, that's, that's life. the magic of it all. So for people that are listening to this, and they want to follow along with you and kind of support your journey and what you're doing, how can they do that? Okay, Lil Monstar, M-O-N-S-T-A-R, is my kind of handle and nickname on Instagram and YouTube. And then on Facebook, it's IFBB Danny Reardon, I think. Um, I'm not as active on there as I should be, but I'm I'm mostly active on Instagram and YouTube. Okay. I find that's where I have the, the biggest impact, and I my voice can be heard the most there. Um, on YouTube, we talk about training, training videos. I do vlog stuff. You can come with me to the Olympia. We've been really good about like doing daily videos and stuff. And then recently I've been talking about, like I talked about like the dark night of my off season, like what I told you about, um, and about positivity and motivation. It's something that I'm kind of something new that's kind of emerging from all of this is kind of speaking. So yeah. So a uh, little monster or Danny Reardon, however you find me. Okay. Yeah. We'll link all of those up in the show notes. And then what about the apparel? How can people get that? Oh, fithustle.com. Fithustle.com and it's under the Little Monster Edition. Uh, we have Believe shirts out right now. Tribe, Mind Body Energy. Um, I have a little energy logo. Oh my God, it's, I love it. I, I love it because it, it it gave me the chance to get like a good vibe out. And one of my one one of my favorite things is hoodie up because when I do cardio, um, I put sweats on, I put a hoodie on. And normally when I train, I do too because the I don't I almost want to take the I don't need to be in a tank top right to be jacked. You know what I'm creating under the hoodie right. So the, the coolest thing is when I get pictures of people sweaty as hell doing cardio in their hoodie. And I know that I know the mindset that they're doing. So, so yeah, fithustle.com is, and you could monster 10 is my coupon code or whatever. You can save 10%, but, um, perfect. Check it out. Lots of good vibes. Awesome. Danny, thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. And good luck next weekend in the Olympia. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, Send me an email at rick at louaviv.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E dot com. Thanks for your support, and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,